Hello, welcome to another episode of Your Guide on Ghana. Today I'm here with William Insweba Maye, who works with the National Museum of Ghana. He's very active when it comes to heritage, history uh, about Ghana. So today I'm going to talk to him about something that I found very interesting, something that I did not know. And it was a real learning experience when he was telling me about it yesterday when I met with him at the University of Ghana. And that is the history of the Zong Massacre. Do you know what the Zong Massacre is? I know I didn't. If you do, that is wonderful that you were aware of it. But for those of you who do not, he is an expert in this area and has a lot of information and has an event coming up on the 9th of May in Cape Coast that's taking place where there's going to be a lecture with some very important people who have a lot to contribute to this conversation. So I'm not going to explain what the Zong Massacre is. I'm going to let him do that since he's the one who has all of the actual factual information. So if you can tell us a little bit about what you do and then get into what the Zong Massacre is. Right. Thank you, Ivy. And uh, uh, I say welcome to the program today's episode. Um, like Ivy said, my name is William and I work with the National Museum. I'm, I'm a heritage scholar and um, uh, a PhD candidate at the University of Ghana studying museums and heritage studies. And uh, this episode is all about the event of the Zong Massacre. And uh, the Zong Massacre, Zong is a, a slave ship that was owned by the Gregson uh, Trading Syndicate in Liverpool. In Liverpool? Yes. So Zong was a slave ship owned by this company in Liverpool in the yes. UK? Yes. And uh, it left the coast of the Gold Coast, today Ghana, on, uh, in 1781 and was heading towards St. Elizabeth in Jamaica. And uh, unfortunately, most of the enslaved Africans on the ship were thrown overboard for several reasons that have been assigned to their act. And uh, Michel Foba, a professor in the University of Manitoba in Canada, mm -hmm. recently discovered the manuscript of the letter, the original letter that was written to the commissioners of the Admiralty for them to treat the case as a, a genocide and human slaughter. So this is fascinating. So she found the original manuscript of the letter, of the letter that was written yes. about this massacre. Yes. And so she's trying to get it um, that it... Be she's published a book out of it already. What's the name of the book? Do you the remember? Book is, the book is titled Letter, Uncovered Letter by the Zong Massacre and all of that. Uncovered Letter, okay. Yes. And so she wants it to be declared a genocide. Yes. She wanted her to declare that particular act. In fact, it is one of the most cited uh, horrible scene in the whole of the passage. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been referenced in several, it's been in court. There are several court cases that has gone travel with this case. And uh, it's well and widely documented in the narrative of the transatlantic slave trade. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board, especially Cape Coast Castle, are fortunate to have come in contact with uh, Michelle Foba, who is coming to deliver the lecture. She's the main speaker. And Michelle Foba is a professor in her field. And she lectures at the University of Manitoba. And she's coming along with a uh, Parchment Brown. Yeah, Donna <laughs> Parchment Brown, which is the ambushman of Jamaica. And she's, she will also be speaking on these issues. And uh, the whole lecture will be introduced by our own professor of history, Professor uh, Akusua Pebi, who is a professor at the history department of the University of Ghana. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, we, these are all individuals that are in their own right, authorities in the areas they want to speak about. And uh, we can't wait. We're inviting everybody to join us at Cape Coast Castle on the 9th of May mm -hmm. to listen to the of uh, the revealing stories that will come out of as a result of the Zong Massacre in 1781. And I'm sure the stories will be very, very revealing. Yeah. As you said, the event is on the 9th of May and it is at Cape Coast Castle. You said it was going to be in the Palava, um, Palava Hall. The Palava Hall. Um, 
I know there's a lot of you who are traveling to Ghana. There's so many people coming here this year because of the year of return. Or maybe you're just coming and you weren't coming for that reason at all. This would be a good time to come if you want to get another piece of history. Because I know a lot of people go to Cape Coast Castle for the purpose of learning about the, the slavery and the history of enslavement of African people. But this is another dimension that will be added to it if you're there on the 9th of May. Even if you're not traveling from outside of Ghana, people in Ghana need to know this too. Yeah. It's very, very important. Why is it so important for local Ghanaians to be aware of these types of stories? Well, it is very, very important for us to get to know this story because, uh, well, it's seen as history, but history is what makes us who we are. And uh, getting to know the narratives related to all of this is what actually defines us. So it's good for us to all appreciate the heritage. It's our heritage. It's the heritage of the world. Mm -hmm. And that is why the whole of the European fortification along the coast is declared a well monument. So uh, the best space to give those original narratives, especially with the original manuscript of the letter that was written being available, is that they couldn't have been any better place than at Cape Coast Castle. And it is in context. That is where everybody will come to understand. And so the lecture is divided in three parts. Three parts? Uh, yes. Okay. The further introductory part, which uh, Professor Akuiswa Pebi will deliver, will give the introduction where he will speak on the various slave routes that were developed during the peak of his, his, his time. And he will trace all of those routes and how the coastal belt became the assembly point of all the routes beyond the borders of modern day Ghana mm -hmm. and then times extending into Burkina Faso, Niger and all of them coming all the way down through that. Mm -hmm. And she will give the context as to how the departure, the last point of departure was at the coastal point. If it was a Danish ship, obviously it would be at the Osu Castle. And if it was a, be any other European country, be the British, be the whatever, it will be Cape Coast. So these are the, this is the context. Once she puts this in, com in perspective, um, Professor Manitoba, Professor Michel Ferber will then speak about the uncovered letter and the discovery of African homeland. Mm -hmm. And then she will speak on that. Then uh, Donald Patchman Brown will also speak on justice, mm -hmm. exile, and the African homeland. Okay, so she's coming from, uh, not she, uh, Donna. Yeah, Donna. Yes. So she's coming from Jamaica. Yeah, she's coming from Jamaica. And she'll be speaking from that perspective of the exactly. people who arrived there yes. from coming from, uh, from here. Perfect. Now, um, how did she find this manuscript? Do you know the story behind it, where she found it and how she found it? Michelle found the original manuscript in the British archives. In the British, British archives. National archives, yes. And from the literature I've read from the abstract of the book, uh, I understand that even the, the archivist wasn't even aware that the original manuscript of that letter was in their collection. You know, it makes me think... So it was like, a, almost like a, a, a chance find. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like um, maybe they weren't aware because it wasn't really that important to them. Because, I mean, if you have things that you've documented in your archives, why wouldn't the historian responsible for those archives be aware of what's inside? Well, it does happen. It happens? Yeah. Really? And you have so much collection. Can you imagine the number of collections they have? Yeah. And they can go through every single of them. Maybe he just recently been brought there and this these archives are as old as you can think. It takes time for somebody to actually go through them mm -hmm. to ascertain exactly what each single document speaks to. So saying that, yeah. there could very well be other documents in there that could be proof of things that happened during the transatlantic slave trade. Of course. I mean, that is, there is a lot of documents that, we, that have not yet come to the knowledge of anybody about documented evidence mm -hmm. of the inhumane aspect of the whole transatlantic slave trade mm -hmm. and the, the, the issues thereof, mm -hmm. be it at the departure point or even at the end point mm -hmm. where the, the brothers that were taken from here eventually ended up. At. So, and even in the passage on the high seas, whatever transpired, the people documented it, but where are the evidence? Mm -hmm. So it is only through some of these researches and some of these public 
uh, fora that some of these things will be brought to bear for the understanding and to make this world a more peaceful space for everybody. Okay. Now, um, I want to ask you, what made you decide that you wanted to even put this together, like have this lecture happening on the 9th of May and bring these people to come and discuss it? What, what um, inspired you to do it? So, um, I think somewhere late last year, I got in touch with um, Michelle mm -hmm. through email address, and she was interested in delivering the lecture here. Unfortunately, as part of this year's program of the National Museum and uh, the broader context of uh, Ghanaian uh, heritage topics, uh, this year is a year of return. And uh, a year of return, uh, literally, is to speak about the uh, events that happen and the opportunities thereof in it. Even though we all agree that it was one of the unfortunate things and uh, never again in the history of humanity should anybody in any form, whether knowingly or unknowingly, encourage such acts. It is important that we use the unfortunate incidents to build bridges among themselves. And once the whole country declared this year as a year of return in the context of what the Americans were to mark, the first documented evidence of transatlantic slave, the first arrival of enslaved persons on the Jamestown in the US, it was appropriate that we put this particular lecture in that context so that it will educate us on because of course there's a return because there was a departure. Of course, of course. Yeah. Now a lot of people that I have talked to or who watch my channel um, have said that they feel uncomfortable knowing that there's white people getting involved when it comes to um, Africans and blacks with their knowledge and their history and they feel like white people should remain out of it and it just happens to be that Michelle Faubert is a white woman from Canada um, do you think that there's people who might be resistant to the fact that she's the one who has this information I, I think it's, a, it's an unfortunate situation to see people resisting it the histories as it is is shared I don't think your, your skin pigmentation should exclude you from telling that story. The history of the world, transatlantic slave trade, and the enslavement of the Africans, it's a shared history. But sometimes I think that even, so everybody has a responsibility mm -hmm. to speak it out. Yes. To make this world a peaceful space. Yes. We shouldn't limit it to any generation and it shouldn't be restricted to any group of people. Mm -hmm. I think everybody had an equal opportunity and an equal right to speak to the issues as per what the literature says mm -hmm. so that we all come to a common understanding mm -hmm. that never again in the history of humanity, whichever form, should this thing happen. Mm -hmm. So I, I think people, we should come together as people of the world who have a common history, a history that depicts the darkest part of humanity. And we all speak about it. And once everybody is speaking about it, I've always told you, ideas are like waves. One day, one day, this world will become a peaceful space. You think we'll see peace in our lifetime? I don't think so. Well, we will. <laughs> I don't think so. I think that will take we will. We will. centuries if it even ever happens. Uh, yeah. You know, peace in the world is one of those things we strive for. But with so much conflict, it's hard to imagine it actually manifesting, you know? Most of these things are as a result of uh, the fears of these discriminations. Mm -hmm. And once we are able to come on a common platform to understand each other, hopefully one day we'll have the peace. Now, have faith. We'll have faith. <laughs> now, I'm sitting here with you at the National Museum of Ghana. We're at the restaurant here, about to have some red red, which is one of my favorite meals. Um, and I see that there's construction going on. Yeah. So if anybody is traveling to Ghana, this is not the best time to come and visit the National Museum of Ghana. What other places do you recommend people can come and visit to get some history while they're here? Okay, so the main gallery of the National Museum is under renovation, mm -hmm. but the staff of the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board work every single day mm -hmm. behind the scenes. But for places of people to understand the history culture of Ghana, heritage of Ghana. We are the same managers of those facilities, Cape Coast, Elmina, 
Hosu Castle, and even on the Mijom compound, mm -hmm. if you give us notice and you tell us your visit was educational, not just to come and if you have a special interest in any particular object that you want to come and see, we make provisions for that. Okay. But just at the main gallery, mm -hmm. which was open to everybody, is closed for renovation. Mm -hmm. As you testify, mm -hmm. renovation That's what I'm saying, is what other options exactly. people have. So the options are that. You can go to a soup castle that is open to the public and every day of the week. It's open every day of the week? Every day of the week. Really? Since when? Because I was told since Fridays last, only. Since, I think <laughs> since last, uh, late last month. Okay, so they've changed it. That's yes, good. That's it's good. open to the public every day of the week. Good. <laughs> Cape Coast Castle is open to the public every day of the week. Yes, Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Park is yeah. just across. Yeah. There are other land spaces that we're going to... Fredericks gave. Frederick's Gave. It's a Danish fortification on the foot Where of the that? mountain. It's at Abukobi. Okay, at which part Medina. Of, okay, so that's close Medina. to Medina, past Medina side of Greater Accra. Yes. And just last week Sunday, I was there with uh, close to 25 students from the University of Copenhagen. What's it called? Ab Abukobi. Abukobi. Yes, but the site is, the plantation site is called uh, Frederick's Gave. Frederick's Gift. Okay. Yes. So Why is it called Frederick's Gift? So there was a, a Danish plantation site. Okay. So and King Frederick was the king then in Denmark, so they named it after him as okay. the gift of Frederick's. Okay. All right. So much of the people who were colonizing through the continent is left over with the names and everything. It's just interesting. Um, now, do you also um, operate or uh, facilitate? The ones in the Volta region, because I recently heard about um, slave forts in the Volta region, and I didn't know that before. It's just the last maybe three months ago that I learned that there's three in that area. Yeah. Does your um, does the National Museum of Ghana um, staff and employees work with that as well, or no? That's a completely separate entity. It is all part of the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board. So all national monuments. Mm -hmm under our management okay so all the 23 or so fortifications along the along coast, the coast. And our management okay. irrespective of the region in which they are found including the ashanti traditional buildings which are in the predominantly in the ashanti region oh okay yes they are all under our management we have a museum at the cape coast uh, the whole Volta region in Ho. We have a museum in Upper East Region. So visitors that are coming to Ghana that will be going up north or that will be staying in Ho, they have opportunity to still see uh, a snapshot of how Ghana will be like, or Ghana in, a, uh, in either Volta Region or in Upper East Region. Thank you. Yes. Oh, yes, it's here, but I'll, I'll eat it in a moment, not at this, not at this exact <laughs> second. One of the things I wanted to know was, what about the north? Are there areas that the National Museum of of Ghana is responsible for as well that people can be aware of and, uh, visiting? Because I always wonder, are there, are there places throughout the country that are also related to the slave trade that they were like transported through on the way, or no? A lot of spaces. There's a lot north. of spaces. Yes, in the north. Not so they don't talk about these. So there's a the slave defense wall in Tumu. Okay. Slave wall. defense wall in, in Tumu. In Tumu. Yeah. In Tumu is in the north. Yes, Tumu is in the north. And there's the Salaga slave market. Yes, the Salaga slave market. I heard it's about also that. in the north. Yes. So I we forgot are, about uh, that. Are, there's a lot of uh, heritage spaces. Mm -hmm. Uh, I told you I'm going for a viva. Somebody is defending his PhD. Yes. It was about German, the resistance of uh, the indigenous people of Dabon and Kunkumba land. For about uh, the resistance against uh, German colonization mm -hmm. of those spaces. Mm -hmm. And he's used uh, historical archaeology as a methodology to uncover some of this evidence exposing uh, the uh, German architecture, foundations of their architecture and some of the things they left behind, remnants of their stay there. Mm -hmm. And some of the wars they fought with the people, and some of the evidence, and like this is what his study is all about, and he'll be prepared. And these are all in the north. 
you know, after the Berlin Conference in 1845, uh, when Europeans partitioned Africa, of course, everybody was grabbing according to, just trying to expand their economies. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot of evidence as long as colonization and uh, slavery is concerned in the coast of uh, Ghana. Yeah. From the coast all the way to the north, uh, there are evidence shows every day. And so how did Cape Coast become the, one of the, I think Cape Coast and Elmina are the two top places people visit. How did those two become the most popular that people visit compared to the other ones? So all of the European fortifications in Ghana mm -hmm. Elmina Castle is the biggest. It's the biggest. It's the biggest among them. Okay. It's bigger than the Cape Coast Castle. And Elmina Castle is the first European fortification that was built. And you have to also know that the capital of Ghana, Gold Coast, was moved from Cape Coast. Cape Coast was once the capital of the Gold Coast okay. when it became a, a British colony. And uh, of course, most of these things, trade developed around those spaces and they have a lot of history they have a lot of shared history memories and inspirations and you can go on it's a place you can go on and you all your six senses will activate themselves you 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 can get inspired by the resistance level and the assistance level of the enslaved people, especially getting to know the inhuman conditions under which they were put and they still survived mm -hmm. and rose beyond that. Mm -hmm. If you go to, you can also get to understand the dynamics that played out even when they were in the dungeons. All of these things activate all the senses in us. We get inspired, we get motivated, you can reflect on them mm -hmm. and all of these things so it's, it's, it's a place that you go and you get to know about what humanity is all about so that is how and we've, we've projected that so much because they were literally built and when they were being open to the public even though the original purpose of them being built was for trade either than the human being but when the human being became the object of interest it still played as a warehouse to the human being so it has a whole lot of narrative biography about the building and the cosmopolitan nature of histories that converge at that point just is that it's a common platform where the whole world can converge because you take Cape Coast Castle or Elmina Castle or any of the fortifications which was not built, you cannot see one of them built and managed throughout its whole life until 1957 by one European country. No. Built by the Swedish, taken by the Danes, Dutch, British, German. Kept changing hands. Kept changing yeah. hands. So you take one facility, there's the history of the Danish people, there's the history of the Swedish, there's the history of the Portuguese, there's the history of the British, and so on and so on. So you go into one facility, if no matter which part of the Europe you are coming for, you have something to learn from it. So that, that's, that's it. All right, you've been very informative today. Thank you. Um, I want to remind everybody that the event that he's having is on the 9th of May in Cape Coast, and he's going to have three important people who are speaking on um, this discovery of this document, which can help to declare this as a genocide. Um, Michelle Faubert will be speaking about the document she found about the Zong massacre. And then um, Donna Parchment from Jamaica is coming to speak on exile, justice. And the home, African homeland. Yeah, and I think that her perspective is going to be really, really profound because, you know, we often don't hear from the Caribbean voice. We often hear a lot from the American, um, African-American voice. So I think that she's a really good addition to the conversation. How can people get tickets or like, how do they get Free admission. Free admission. Free admission. Cape Coast Castle, 9, 10 a.m. Free admission? Don't they have to pay admission into the castle? 
Oh, for the public lecture. Okay, so for the, for the public, public lecture, lecture, it's free admission. But entrance to the Cape Coast Council remains 40 CD for non Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and for Ghanaians, it's 5 CD? 5 CDs. Yeah. Okay. All right, so people can go Cape Coast Council, 9th of May. What time? 10 a.m. The lecture starts at 10 a.m. Okay, and if somebody wants to get in touch with you to ask you any questions, how do they reach you? By email? Via email and my telephone number. And what's your email? You can state it. Yes, my Instagram at Gmail, G-M-A-Y-I. Your name? Oh, yes. You know what, I'll put it on the screen. Exactly, please. I'll put it on please the screen. Do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you so much for giving me some, some time today to talk about this event. Never mind, you're and, always welcome. Um, yeah, don't miss out if you're here. It's something that you definitely will learn from. Different perspective. It's not the usual history event. It's not the usual historical um the word I'm looking for. It's not usual. It's not the usual thing that people hear about. It's normally you go to this. You go to the the castle, which I think they should just be called forts. You go to Cape Coast Castle Fort, um, and then you experience what it was like, and you can actually feel like it feels like you feel the spirit of these people from yeah. that time. So yeah. anybody, if you ever visited before, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and if you ever do visit, you will experience it. You feel like you can feel the presence of the ancestors when you're in those slave forts um, but this will be a different type of experience at all learning at all. a lot about what happened with because i know i've heard of people being thrown overboard but i didn't hear about the specific zong massacre and they were all um, thrown as i am 132 132 people yeah and oh and you you had said it was um they get three cities per head or three dollars three pounds. Three so pounds. so with each person who they threw overboard when they arrived there was an indemnity based on the insurance for them to get three pounds per head. Three pounds per head of person that they Other than before. taking a very weak person onto the coast, which cannot even sell up to a pound. Yeah. So it was purely based on economic decision. That's my opinion. So well, okay. to get to know more, meet me at Cape Coast Castle yes. on the 9th. Yes, on May the 9th of this year, 10 a.m. Don't miss it. Thank you so much for your time Welcome, today. welcome. Thanks for watching another episode of Your Guide on Ghana. I'll see you next time.